Today we take a look at the wine-based board game Vinhos, specifically Vinhos Deluxe Edition, published by Eagle Griffin Games. Mm -hmm. Before we pour the first glass, we do have to say that Eagle Griffin was awesome enough to provide us with a review copy of Vinhos Deluxe. So the original version of Vinhos was developed and designed by Vitsal Lacerda and features art by Mariano Ianelli and was published by What's Your Game? That was back in 2010. This new updated version of Vinhos, the deluxe edition, was also designed by Vital Lacerda. So we had the original designer come back and do some tweaks to his game, but also features updated artwork and graphic design by Ian O'Toole. Vinhos Deluxe was published in 2016 by Eagle Griffin. Now this is a big meaty board game box filled to the brim <laughs> with wood and cardboard. For a good look at everything you get in this box, be sure to check out our Vino Deluxe unboxing video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. One bit of warning though, this was one of the first unboxing videos we ever recorded, so it's not quite up to our current standards. No, but you do get to see everything. Now also for a full list of components, uh, this is a very full box. Check out the blog version of this review at tabletopbellhop.com because I am not going to spend the time to go over every little component here. What I will say is the board is huge. It's a big six panel board, um, two sided and extremely well designed with a place for everything, easy to read icons and a layout that actually not only just makes sense, but actually helps with the flow of the game, which thanks, you know, tool for that one. Actual component quality is top of the line. Like this is deluxe, not even just as a, we put out a new copy with some new rules. This is deluxified. Um, you have very thick cardboard tokens in this game. Like I would say twice as thick as you get in your average game. Plus excellent, great looking wooden components. Your meeples actually look like little farmers and on all analogists. You also get a set of fantastic player aids, like some of the best in the industry for summarizing the game on two pages that of course look like tasting menus, which is a nice touch. Well, we mentioned this on the show before, but this is a game that does theming right. Mm. If you want immersion, you've got it. So great components. How about the gameplay? All right, so in Vinhos, you players are going to take on the role of winemakers in Portugal. Now, you may or may not know this, but Portugal is one of the world's leading wine producers. This is a trading and economic game that encompasses all aspects of winemaking, starting from setting up your first estate with your first vineyard, which has to be situated in one of 10 different wine regions of Portugal. You're going to improve that estate by building vineyards and cellars and uh, wineries on the, on the estate. You're going to hire onologists and farmers. You're going to utilize wine experts to get more done in a year. You're going to sell wine to local establishments to generate income, whereas shipping wine overseas gives you points. As well, three times during the game, you are going to attend the World Wine Festival and a tasting, showcasing your best wines and trying to impress three very picky wine magnates. So just your normal lifelong career for a winery condensed into a single sitting game. Yeah, pretty much. Now, I'm sure you can tell by now, this is meaty. There's a lot going on. Now, on top of all of that, Vinhos Deluxe includes two different ways to play. One is the 2010 Reserve Edition of the game, which is very close to the original game released in 2010, thus the 2010 Reserve. Uh, there's just a few minor rule tweaks and balances that were put in by the designer to make the game a little better. Then there's the new, with this edition, 2016 Vintage, which is an updated, more streamlined version of play that's just a bit lighter and quicker and definitely more approachable to new players. Now, what I'm going to go over here for a in some detail is the 2016 vintage. Seeing as that's the newest version, uh, it's now like the standard way to play. It's, it's what they expect you to play. And they kind of like, we included the 2010 for fans. Now I'm still gonna try to keep things fairly high level. So we're not here all night, but this is gonna take a bit to go through. Now, once I do, I will highlight some of the differences that are featured in the 2010 reserve edition. So that's right, check your watches because we're only covering <laughs> half of the deluxe editions offering for the rest you're gonna have to check the blog yeah even on the blog i still don't even get into as deep as i normally would for one of these reviews i say heavy game but tell us uh, you can't help it with this game so at the start of the game you're going to start off with one estate containing one vineyard and wine produced from that vineyard and one bonus action tile each of the 10 different regions on the map provide a different bonus and players get that bonus for the first estate 
These bonuses are actually tied to actual wine characteristics of each region. And the rule book even summarizes why you get different bonuses for different regions. Again, I'm not gonna dive into that there, but the bonuses are things like getting farmers for free, getting a free cellar, having a free winery, producing wine that presents well at tasting festivals and so on. Right off at the start, we see that asymmetry that we love. Very true, though in this one, there's nothing stopping a player later in the game for buying a winery in the same region as you, which is actually a very valid strategy. Now, finally, each vineyard founded in a region, you put a reputation cube on that region. These are later spent to up the value of wine for that region, and it represents the buzz and the hype in the world about that region. Now, speaking of value, this is an important concept of the game. The difference between wine quality and wine value. Wine quality is determined by your vineyards, your farmers, your wineries, and your onologists. This is set when the wine's produced and doesn't change. Once you produce the wine, it stays the same quality. Wine value, on the other hand, is more variable. Value modifiers are added on top of quality. And this comes from things like cellars, the region a wine comes from, and the reputation of the wine's region. Those can all affect wine value. So once you put, in a, cor once you put a cork in it, the wine is the wine, and that is the quality. Mm -hmm. But value is more ephemeral and can change with the seasons. Maybe right now everyone wants that 74 Monte Mont Blanc, but next year it's the 82 Chauvignon that's driving folks wild. Those wine, wines' quality haven't changed since they were bottled, but their value has swung. Very exact. And this is a good example of how, again, the theme ties in with the mechanics of this game. Now, a game of Vinhos is played over only six rounds. At the start of each round, there's a vintage tile that's flipped. It's like an event tile. This sets the weather for the season and lets you know what the wine magnates are looking for that season when it comes to the wine tasting festivals. Each round, players only get two actions. Note that. Six rounds, two actions, 12 actions in the entire game. Players start with and can earn bonus actions as well, though, giving them some additional actions, but only one per turn. After each set of two actions, there's an upkeep phase and a wine production phase. Now, three times during the game, the normal flow of play is interrupted and you play out a wine tasting fair. Note, it's at the start of the round, so you can't look ahead and plan for round two while you're still in round one, as so many games that lay out goals in advance for the whole game. Yes, you, you technically are playing out different years and you, you are stuck with that tile for the year and you have no clue what's coming the next year. And trust me, when you get a, a, a minus two weather, it can be horrible. Now, actions in mean hosts are determined through worker placement. Um, they, the game calls this a quadrille, which is a term I've never heard before. Because it's the only place I've heard it, I have not thrown it on our game mechanics episode or our game mechanics list because I don't know of it being used anywhere else. But what this is is a three-by-three three grid of actions. And in general, players are free to choose any action they want going on a spot, um, any action they want, but moving more than one spot or going on to the spot that marks the current round costs the player money. If you move where other players are, you actually have to pay the other players money. So it's a unique worker placement where you're not blocking spots, but being there does cost other players more money. Now, these actions include buying up to two new vineyards. These can be used to start new estates, which players can have a maximum of five, or used to improve existing estates by buying vineyards from the same region, but then the wine type has to match. So you, have to, you can't mix red and white wine. If you have a red vineyard, you have to add another red vineyard. You can buy up to two cellars. Cellars allow players to store wine longer, and cellared wine does increase in value as time goes on. You can hire anologists or farmers. Each of these are ways to improve the quality of your wine when you get to the production phase. You can hire wine experts. Uh, players can purchase up to two. There are four different types, an expert in taste, nose, look, and alcohol percentages. Uh, these can give players bonus actions and can also be used at a tasting fair to get more fair points. But only if the magnates care about the specialization of that expert that year. Shipping wine, you spend wine and one of your barrels, you have a limited number of these barrels, and earn points based on the value of the wine spent. Players start with a limited number of barrels, but can earn more. There's also an end game area majority aspect to shipping, but I'm not going to get into exactly how it works, but just know that there's area majority there. And then selling wine. This is almost the same as shipping, except the players are earning money instead of points. And this is also a way they can get their barrels back. So when you sell wine locally, you make money, but your barrels, eventually they use it up and return your barrels to you so you can refill them. Finally, you can pass. 
And when you pass, you can do a press release. And this is another thing that, again, just ties the theme into this game. The final action spot lets you pass, and that lets you change player order for the next turn. You can decide if you want to go first, last, or in the middle. The press release is basically like going to the wine tasting festival early, which, again, I'm not going to get into why, but it can be advantageous in some situations. So that's not many options. No. But they're rich, and you want to do all of them. Mm -hmm. They're all supremely valuable to you, and you can't ever do them all. No, never. Now, during production, really simple. First thing that happens, all your age, wine age, you shift them to the right on your board. If they happen to go off the edge of your board, they're wasted, which is why you might want a seller, because normally you can only hold the wine for two years. Uh, then you will produce wine. Note that starting estates can only hold two wine tokens and sellers can hold four. So that's one of the main reasons to build sellers. Plus sellers increase the value of your wine as it ages. So note value improves with age, not with quality. Exactly. Now play continues with players taking their actions, improving their estates until we get to one of the three tasting fairs. Tasting fairs. The first thing you're going to do is submit a press release if you haven't done one already, but this is the same method if you were doing one. And you're going to select one of your wines to feature. You're going to get a number of fair points based on the value of the wine. Note this isn't victory points. This is unrelated. These are fair points. You're then going to pick one of the four display booths at the fair, and that'll give you an immediate bonus. It also sets player order for the next turn. Uh, these bonuses include bonus uh, money, bonus fair points, or getting a free wine expert, which trust me, getting a free wine expert well at the fair can be very useful. Next players can spend their wine experts. There are four different types. And each type of expert can be spent based on the vintage tile displayed. So what the magnates want. So it might be this fair that nose is really powerful. So if you spend a, a green is, is the nose representation. If you spend a green expert, you'll get points for having presented wines with a good nose. The next fair, it might be more about taste or the next one might be all about alcohol content, whatever. So, I would argue that there could be an entire game that was just this aspect of this bigger game uh, that was a wine fair tasting competition. I mean, yeah, there, I there's, enough, there's enough in this to make its own game. Yeah, well, I agree. that This is definitely like a micro game yeah. as part of playing Vinos. So now the last step of the fair is there are three wine magnates, the most important people in the world that have to do with the wine industry, right? And Based on the vintage tile, again, that comes up at the beginning of the year, they're each going to be looking for a specific type of wine they'll be impressed with. One of them either wants a white or a red each season. Another one wants wine of a specific quality, so at least a six this year, or at least a nine. And the last one will want wine from a specific region. For each of these qualities that the wine you submitted in your press release matches, you can take a barrel from that magnet to a maximum of two barrels. This is the way you get more barrels so you can ship more and so you can sell more. After all players have submitted a press release, you're gonna get points. So now you look at that fair track, whoever's highest is gonna get the most points, whoever's second highest is gonna get a little less and so on. What's interesting is your reputation doesn't go away. Your spot on that spare, tr the fair track stays for the rest of the game. So you can just keep building on earlier successes. No, and remember how you couldn't do all the actions you wanted to? Well, maybe now you can do a tiny bit more. Yeah, the reason for that is you can spend your barrel or you can spend wine that's left over at the end of the festival to buy bonus tiles off these magnates. Now, early in the game, these are bonus actions. These are these are things that let you do more. Later in the game, they'll become they become end game scoring opportunities. Now, after the third tasting fair, everyone's gone around a few more times. The game ends. You calculate final scoring. There's a number of things you're going to get points for here. There's the money that's left over, you have left. The wine you have left in your estate, you get add up all its quality and divide by two. The majorities on the shipping tracks, and then those end game bonus tiles you've collected. Now, the end game bonus tiles are for pretty much everything in the game. Like there's a tile that covers almost everything. So there's like one for the most, whoever, like having vineyards, and there's one for having farmers, and one for having wine tokens, one for having enologists, one for having filled estates, and so on. The player with the most points after that scoring wins. Well, at least figuring out the winner is easy if nothing <laughs> else in the game is. Very true. What I'm not sure offhand is what the tiebreaker happens to be, but there is one. Though we have never yet seen a game end in a tie. Usually the, the scores are far, fairly far apart. So that was the 2016 Vintage Rules. 
I don't want to go into all of it, but I will point out some of the major differences in the 2010 reserve version. The first off is that this is more of an economic game. There is a bank. This is the biggest change from 2010 to 2016 and affects multiple aspects of the play. This is the kind of thing you see in heavy euros um, like this game in train games. Like I'm instantly reminded of like steam and brass a bit here. Instead of just a pile of bagos, which is the money in Portugal, instead of just a pile of money in front of you, you now have to handle on hand cash and money in the bank. There's now a bank action players can take where they can make deposits, make withdrawals, as well as investments. Along with this are a number of price changes on specific items and things like now having to pay your analogists a salary every season. Because the complexity of weather, favoritism, science, and competitive geoeconomic balances wasn't enough, they needed to add in banks. Yes. Though actually what they did is they took them out in the easier version. These, these were already here in the original. So also in the 2010 reserve are a number of smaller changes, like you can't hire farmers. Uh, selling wine now deposits money to the bank and not your hand, which is important at times. Uh, your wine experts can be used every any time instead of once per turn. Uh, bonus action tiles and the end game scoring tiles have been completely removed. Um, and instead of earning barrels from the magnates, you now, when you impress them, give them barrels and then can spend wine to move those barrels and do actions based on which magnet you're on. And each magnet has their own special actions to them. Right. And that seems like a pretty huge swing uh, in, yeah. in game. Yeah, it's a big difference. Having played both versions, it's definitely like you have to think a different way to, to try to get the bonus actions. And overall, they're a lot harder to earn, I would say. Now, the wine tasting fair is the other significant change. Um, the quality of line, wine submitted no longer translates into fair points. What it does is sets how many wine experts you can bring with you to the fair. Booths picked determine which wine qualities between the four, taste, nose, look, and alcohol percentage, will score points, and which wine experts you can use to score those points. Then you take your experts, all of them, and put them in your hand, and you have a blind bid auction where you are hiding how many you're revealing and then everyone flips up their experts and then scores based on how well those experts match the different criteria of that year uh, it's, it's definitely very different from the original each of the different four different qualities of wine are on their own unique track and they go up when that vintage style is flipped and when special ex certain experts are played so in some ways these are almost really two pretty different games with shared concept and theme yeah, there, there's quite a few differences. It still kind of feels the same overall. Right. Uh, it's obviously there's more to, to it than this, but like, as you can tell, the 2010s, a step up in complexity and weight. Um, there's a lot more for players to think about. There's a lot more to manage. And there's uh, actually a reduced number of actions in the game. So you have less time to do the things you're trying to do. Now, in addition to these two main methods of play, the game also includes a full set of solo rules, which puts you up against the terrible AI Lacerda. Uh, this method of play is card-driven and achievement-based, where uh, Lacerda doesn't have a player board, and it has to do with flipping cards to see what they do every round. It's interesting. So for those keeping track at home, that's three games inside this deluxe box. Yeah, I don't know if anyone would buy this just to play the solo. I will admit, fully admit, I did not try the solo. I am not a big solo gamer. That's not why I purchased this game. But it is something worth mentioning because I know there are a lot of solo gamers out there. And right now, a lot of people who aren't really solo gamers who are playing games solo. So as for my overall thoughts, before even playing this game, before I approached Eagle Griffin's booth at Origins and asked for a review copy of this, I knew I was going to like it. This is the kind of game that's right in my wheelhouse. This just, I like Vitalis Artist style of games. What I didn't expect is just how much I'd like it. A huge part of this is how well the mechanics and graphic design and everything ties to the theme of winemaking. This is the perfect example of a heavy media game that's much easier to digest due to having its theme so well integrated. Along with that, it also does a lot of things right for making the game more approachable. Things like having a very well-made player aid, varying the component types, the, the materials the components are made out of, items that are icons that are used to for different things, having a solid rule book, uh, excellent design and typography. So they have really covered all of the bases that we've talked about in our episode on keeping it easy. Yeah, the only thing they're missing is the, the limiting player options. That, right from the start, you got all the, your first decision in the game. This is the one thing that makes this game rough. Your first decision of the game is 
pick a pick pick one of 10 wineries to start going with and if you don't know the game and each gives a different bonus that part's rough the the only thing i almost would have preferred is a starter setup that says player one starts with this winery and this and player two starts with this and this and player three starts with this and this player four starts with this and this and with these bonus tiles i think that would have really helped for the first play or teach of the game and i bet you if you go on board game geek someone's done that work but that's the only thing that i think out of our list of fit what 13 things you can do to improve your game that, that they missed out on right what i gotta say though is despite the fact that the the beginning is a little rough Every time I've sat down with someone to play Vien Host Deluxe, they've started off intimidated because it's a big board with a lot of stuff. And then you start talking about wine regions and all of that stuff. And, and it always ends up easier than they expected. Now, I will say this is not an easy game. Uh, it's learning the mechanics that's straightforward and how to do everything. But learning to play well is a totally different matter. There is a lot going on in this game. And I am sure you can tell from my attempt at a short summary that I probably didn't even cover it all. And there's a lot to think about. Now, one of the things that did surprise me is its appeal to players who don't normally love heavy games. And again, I think it's that connection of theme to mechanics that makes this work. But I've gotten players who are like, I hate Food Chain Magnet, and I'd never play Indonesia, but will sit down and happily play Vinhos Deluxe. Yeah, and I think a lot of people underrate the importance of theme tie-in. And we've talked about how we don't always discuss theme. and But that's in part because a lot of games, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Here it does. It really does. This is, I, I think that's such an overused term for podcasters and reviewers, but I would call this an elegant game in many ways. And the elegance goes beyond the top-notch components and the EO Tools excellent design work and actually encompasses the mechanics of the game itself. The way the game flows, it just feels right. Like it feels like you're doing the right things for the right reasons to get to the right goals and to get to this goal, the things you have to do just make sense. I also love the game, way the game ramps up. So one of the things that I didn't really get into in the, into the details is that that first tasting doesn't happen until the third year, but then the second one happens only after two years and the third one happens only one year. So there's this ramp up of less and less time and limited actions to get things done before it matters. And I love the, the engine building. I see my estates grow and the wine they produce improve over the years. And there's just something rewarding about playing this game. Even if you don't win, just like you feel like you've done something. It's just something you don't get from lighter games. So now that we've showered it with praise, <laughs> are there any rough edges? I, if I had any complaints about Venus, it would just be the sheer number of rules, especially when you're got multiple versions mixed in there, like the amount of Vinos in my head right now is a little crazy. Having played days apart, two different versions of the game with this many different moving parts, it's easy to forget something. Like I know we've made a number of mistakes in our early games, things like forgetting that players only get the region bonus for their first vineyard placed in a new estate, not for every vineyard purchase or forgetting to place renowned cubes in a region. That one's terrible. I often forget how to place renowned cubes or placing renowned cubes for items rewarded as region bonuses, which don't aren't supposed to get them. But then you think every time you add a seller, you get a region bonus, but no, no, not if it's a region bonus, it's different. And not remembering that shipping and selling, requires a minimum value, not an exact one, as well as misunderstanding how some of the bonus tiles work. This right. is a game, I, we said this often enough, but in, in particular, play it once, then sit back down with the rules or watch a, a watch it play it or a gaming rules or something like double check. And I would even say after your first few plays, just to see if you miss something on those initial plays. There's just so much going on. Right, it's always a good idea to do this anyway, but it's particularly important on these heavier games. Yeah. Now, as for which version of the game you should play, 2016 or 2010, I strongly recommend starting with 2016. The reduced complexity and not having to worry about things like investments and banking and blind bidding are going to help players get the core concepts of the game, of wine quality versus value and aging and sending press releases. Those are the same in both versions. After you've got the basics down, I do strongly suggest you try the 2010 version and then see what you prefer. I've noticed online people seem to be split like 50-50. When playing both ourselves, uh, Deanna really liked the bank aspect of it. 
I personally liked that tasting festival version better and the way the wine experts were. Both of us were really felt weird about the putting barrels to the magnates tape bonus actions compared to having a tile in front of you and flipping it and reach it just felt weird but that doesn't mean there was anything wrong with it so i don't know like overall if i'm presenting this to a new group i'm going to start with 2016 no matter what but i could see hardcore gamers possibly wanting to jump in on the 2010 and especially if you played the original and like the original maybe you stick with the 2010 Overall, I've enjoyed every single game I played of Veen Host Deluxe. I have not had a bad game night with it. I look forward to playing this game even more and exploring new strategies because with that many rules and options, it's almost a sandbox. There are so many different ways you can go. If you're a fan of heavy engine building games that are closely tied to themes, you probably own Veen Host Deluxe. And if you don't, you should probably fix that. It is definitely well worth it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Where I will also suggest this game, though, is for players who normally prefer medium weight games or slightly heavy games, because what we have here is I would almost say a gateway heavy game. It's a, a heavy game that's surprisingly easy to learn, and it's one that I found a lot of not heavy gamers have really enjoyed. Now, for those of you who like lighter games that you can play in an hour or less, you're probably going to want to stay away from this one. But if you're ever curious about trying something heavier, I think this would be a great place to start. Well, for a more in-depth look at Vinhost Deluxe, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.